In this lecture, we'll talk about how we go about measuring brain function. Now, the goal of cognitive neuroscience is often thought of as understanding how it is that the brain gives rise to the mind. And in order to do this, we have to be able to measure the brain. So how do we go about measuring brain function? Um, so one important thing to, to understand is that neuroscience methods vary along at least two different dimensions. One is what we call spatial resolution. That's the size of the features that the, the method can uh, resolve. And the other is temporal or time resolution, which is the speed at which it can resolve events. This is a well-known figure from uh, originally published by Sanofsky and colleagues back in 1988, laying out all of the different ways that one can measure brain function and how they vary along both the time and spatial dimension. And you can see going from 1988 to 2014, there's been a substantial uh, increase in the ability to, to measure brain function. Now we're gonna focus on human brain function in this course. Um, and so um, the primary ways that we go about measuring human brain function are either measuring electrical activity or the downstream correlates of electrical activity in terms of blood flow. So we can measure electrical activity using um, electroencephalography on the scalp or by measuring the, the magnetic fields that arise from electrical activity using magnetoencephalography or MEG. These methods both have relatively high temporal resolution in that they can resolve events happening on the order of milliseconds, but relatively low spatial resolution in the sense that um, they can only resolve features of the order of centimeters. And both of them have whole brain coverage. So we can see pretty much the entire brain. Now, one method that's uh, fairly limited, but um, but is sometimes available, is intracranial EEG. This is measurement of electrical activity directly from inside a human's brain, which primarily happens in the context of surgery for people um, who are going to undergo resection for epilepsy. Um, and um, this is a method that has high temporal resolution and high spatial resolution. Its limitation is that we generally have low coverage such that you might have no more than 100 recording sites across the brain. So you're limited in the amount of brain that you can see. And the, the regions differ between each individual because they're based on clinical needs, not based on scientific plans. We're going to focus primarily on functional MRI in this course, or fMRI. This is a method that has relatively low temporal resolution. It can resolve events on the order of seconds but relatively high spatial resolution in the sense that it can resolve features at the level of millimeters. And it also has whole brain coverage. Now, fMRI has um, become pretty much the dominant method for human brain imaging. This is a plot of the, the cumulative number of hits in the PubMed database for a search on functional MRI and brain. And what you can see is that, um, you know, now there are more than 10,000 publications a year and it's increasing rapidly. Now, it's amazing that fMRI really works at all. Our ability to use fMRI to measure brain function relies on a number of biological and physical facts. And if any of these were not the case, the way that we usually do fMRI just wouldn't work. The first of those is the fact that brain function is relatively localized. That is, uh, for any particular cognitive function, it's generally not going to rely on the entire brain, but it's going to rely on a subset of brain regions. Now, this doesn't discount the importance of network integration or connectivity or of redundancy of function, but nonetheless, we know that there exists a relative uh, localization of function. This is just one example seen on the right um, of uh, a phenomenon known as spatial neglect. And there turns out that there's two forms of spatial neglect. One called egocentric neglect is a neglect in which the person neglects part of space. Um, in this case, the individual is performing a task where they're supposed to put a line through any of the hearts that have a gap in their, uh, in their outline. And on the left, you see that a person with egocentric neglect basically fails to see the, the features on the left side of space. On the other hand, allocentric neglect involves uh, a neglect of a particular part of an object. So this person fails to cross out any of the hearts that have the, the break on the left side whereas they, um, they, they don't miss the ones on the right side as much. Um, and so um, and, you, and you can see at the bottom that these different types of neglect are associated with different brain lesions. This is uh, data from a lesion mapping study. 
Now, it turns out that that localization is also relatively similar across individuals. Um, that is that there's a general layout of brain function, um, and that layout seems to be common between individuals, at least at a gross level. Although each individual has variants in the specific organization that's sort of overlaid on that general plan. Um, this is shown in the figure on the bottom left, um, which is looking at resting state functional connectivity. This is correlations in activity when a person's sitting in a fMRI scanner doing nothing um, and um, showing that which regions sort of move together. And this shows that, you know, in a group of more than 100 people, you see regions that are color coded that commonly move together. On the other hand, the individual data at the bottom is actually data from my brain collected over the course of a year and a half. Um, we see that the general plan seems to be the same, but there are some regions that seem to sort of be functioning differently than we would have expected, given what we see in the group. So there's a general plan, but each individual sort of varies uh, at the fine grain level. Now, we also know from work using meta-analyses that we can sort of combine data across people and get insights into the localization of function across people. Um, and we see this from the work of Tal Yarkoni um, in the Neurosynth project, where he developed a tool that allowed us to basically automatically extract the activation coordinates, that is the local the locations of uh, of fMRI activity that were presented in papers. And he did this for about 14,000 papers. And then what we were able to do is sort of combine the data across those papers to come up with a, a decoder, if you will, so that we can then take data from new individuals and say, you know, some of these people were doing a working memory task, some were doing a task involving emotion, some were doing a task involving pain, and ask, can we classify which of those things they were doing based on this statistical model built from the literature. And it turns out that we can do that fairly accurately. The only way that could work is if this, there's a general plan that's fairly consistent across people in the localization of function. A third thing that turns out to be the case is that blood flow changes in relation to neural firing. This was known actually back in the 19th century in the work of uh, Roy and Sherrington, who noted that there was a change in blood supply that varied in accordance with the activity of the neurons. Um, and the birth of fMRI, which, as we're going to see, relies on blood flow, um, led to a renewed interest in understanding that relationship. And we now know from work, both using simultaneous functional MRI and electrophysiological recordings, as you see at the top right, or functional MRI and um, optical imaging recordings, as you see on the bottom right. And in both cases, we know that, at least under some conditions, there can be a very tight relationship between the level of spiking in neurons and the, uh, the level of blood flow response. And interestingly, that blood flow response turns out to be an overreaction, at least in terms of the amount of oxygen that's being used. This is sometimes referred to as watering the entire garden for the sake of one thirsty flower. And we know this, um, this was first discovered uh, in work using optical imaging to measure the blood flow response. Um, on the right, you see plots of the, the, the left hand of those two plots is um, the deoxygenated hemoglobin response. And then the right word is the oxygenated hemoglobin response. And what you notice is that very early uh, after a stimulus is presented, there's a slight blip up in the amount of deoxyhemoglobin. But suddenly you get a very large, over the course of seconds, you get a very large uh, surplus of oxygenated hemoglobin. So basically the, the vasculature sends more oxygen than is needed to make up for the metabolic demands of the tissue. And it turns out that we can also measure those blood oxygen changes um, using MRI because of the differences in the magnetic properties between deoxyhemoglobin and oxygenated hemoglobin. Um, with the right kind of MRI image, we can actually create images such that the, the more oxygenated hemoglobin there is, the brighter the image. And this was seen in, um, this is an image from the first uh, functional MRI study using this kind of, of MRI contrast. And this shows when a person moved their hand, um, you can see activity where it says stim going up. When they rest, it goes down. Stim, it goes up. This is in the, the motor cortex. So this shows us how we can actually go about measuring the blood flow response using fMRI. Now, fMRI is challenging for a number of different reasons. The first is that um, the signals are relatively weak. 
about the strongest signal we ever observed with fMRI is on the order of four to five percent signal change. You can see this on the right with a response to a brightly flashing visual checkerboard in the visual cortex. And you can see that, you know, with three of these trials kind of concatenated together, so lots of lots of stimulation of the visual cortex, you see about a four and a half percent signal change. And that's about as big as it ever gets. Cognitively interesting signals are generally about an order of magnitude smaller than this. And so, um, for example, on the bottom left, you see the response in the prefrontal cortex to a person making semantic judgments, deciding whether uh, these words are, are abstract or concrete. And here you see that the response is on the order of about 0.25%. So about an order of magnitude smaller than the visual cortex response. Now, there's also a number of um, sources of noise that can swamp the, uh, the MRI signal. Some of these involve breathing and heartbeat, but probably the biggest one is head motion. You can see in the video here, um, the kinds of image artifacts that are induced when a person is moving around a lot in the scanner. This is a child with Tourette syndrome um, moving quite a bit, and you can see these, these artifacts in the image. So that's a, a big challenge for, for fMRI. There are also other systematic artifacts that make some parts of the brain very difficult to image. In particular, there are parts of the brain where air that are near places where air and tissue meet. These would be places like uh, right above the sinuses and right above the ear canals. And the, the differences in magnetic susceptibility between air and tissue result in magnetic fields that change the signal there. At the bottom, you see there's sort of a, a dropout in the middle of the orbitofrontal cortex. If you look on the right, you can see that area between the eyes. There should be brain there. If you look at the left, there's a big hole. And that's be exactly because of that artifact. So there's some areas of the brain that are particularly difficult to image. We also know now that fMRI signals can often be unreliable. And by reliability, what I mean here is the stability of the size of the signal that's measured in the brain. So I give a person a task to do, I measure how much brain response there is to that in the fMRI signal, and then I do that twice and look at how consistent that signal is over the two times. And we now know from, uh, for example, from this large meta-analysis by Elliot and colleagues, that, um, that that stability is much less than we might hope. In general, you know, when we quantify uh, reliability using a coefficient that goes from zero to one, we'd like for that reliability to be at least 0.7 or 0.8 in order to give us sufficient signal, a sufficiently reliable signal, that is. But um, they found that the average reliability across a large number of studies was on the order of about 0.4. This is likely due to an insufficient measurement within each individual. We're, not just, we're just not collecting enough data for each individual. Now, we know that when we collect enough data, fMRI can be highly reliable. This is, uh, again, data from the study that we did on me over the course of a year and a half, collecting many hours of resting state functional MRI data. And here we're looking at the reliability of the, um, the functional connectivity estimates that were obtained. And what you see is that it takes about 100 minutes of data for those, um, those functional connectivity estimates to become highly reliable. Um, and that's much more data than most functional MRI studies collect. And so this suggests that we need to collect more data in general to increase the reliability of our measurements. Now, finally, I want to highlight the fact that we can validate functional MRI using brain stimulation. Um, this is uh, an example from a study by uh, Joseph Parvizi and colleagues, um, where they first did functional MRI on an individual who was about to undergo surgery for epilepsy. And they isolated the regions in the temporal lobe that respond to pictures of human faces. What they then did was perform the surgery and ended up putting some electrodes right on top of those areas that had been responsive in functional MRI. And then they actually put electrical current into those electrodes to, um, to basically disrupt the activity in those areas. And what they saw was when they did that, you can see the, the description of what the individual experienced. You just turned into somebody else. Your face metamorphosed. So this shows us that um, disruption of the areas that are activated in fMRI can uh, can provide a, a very strong link between the functional role of the regions that fMRI is identifying. Now we're gonna see later that we can't always make these kinds of inferences. So in summary, 
fMRI provides us with the ability to indirectly measure neural responses that relate to specific cognitive processes. Now, there's many challenges in obtaining valid measures of brain function using fMRI. And in particular, we need to ensure that we have sufficient data to precisely quantify brain function.